All right, let's get started. Hello, everybody, and welcome to today's webinar, Conducting a Systematic Review with Laser AI. My name is Shelby Storm, and I'm the digital, digital marketing lead here at Evidence Prime. We're really thrilled to see the level of interest and response that we got for this webinar. So we're really excited to have you here with us today, and thank you for taking the time. Our agenda is pretty simple. We'll start with a live demo given by Arthur Novak. He is our co-founder and CTO of Evidence Prime. We then have a Helium new functionalities presentation, a video that Eager Chiz has prepared for us, and this will all be wrapped up nicely with a little bow with the Q&A session of 15 minutes. I'm going to hand straight over to Arthur and thank you to the panelists and attendees. Thank you. <clears throat> thank you, Shelby. Uh, I will uh, cut straight to the chase and uh, uh, walk you through basic steps of setting up a project, but then uh, also how you can speed up your literature reviews uh, with help of laser AI. Uh, so this is a much requested webinar uh, from uh, many um, of uh, attendees of our other demos to really um, show how it really how it starts, how uh, you can configure your project, how you can invite people to join you in your uh, reviews. Uh, and um, uh, without further ado, let's start. So what you can see right now uh, is the dashboard uh, that is um, featuring a list of projects. Uh, and whenever you are in laser AI, uh, you can orient yourself by looking at this um, uh, top bar here, which um, tells you basically where you are. So as I go through different screens here, you can always uh, look at the top of my screen uh, to orient yourself uh, whenever we are uh, in the screening or in data extraction. Uh, whenever you get lost, please just um, to take a look at what I have at the top of my screen. Uh, on the left-hand side, we have different modules or different actions that I can um, um, perform from this screen. So uh, the one that I have highlighted is the list of projects. And um, here in the list of projects, you can already see a couple interesting things. So first of all, that we can archive or delete projects. Um, uh, archiving is uh, perhaps more uh, suited for uh, actual work that you uh, do and then you want to keep track of this. Uh, you have no limits in terms of how long you want to st store your projects in the tool. Feel free to make uh, our tool your archive for all your performed work. Uh, however, in the archive projects, um, anybody who would like to make any changes will be notified that it's impossible because uh, these projects are now in read-only mode. They need to be brought back um, to uh, the active state in order to make any changes in them. Uh, you can also see that my projects are grouped into folders. Uh, this helps a lot whenever you, uh, for instance, do multiple reviews as part of one uh, guideline, for instance, and you want to group them together. And you can also uh, see these colorful dots on the right. Um, and uh, I think opening filters will uh, explain what they are all about. Uh, within the tool, uh, you can check what is the, sta what is the status of uh, retrieving full text or PDF files for uh, references at different points in the project. And if you uh, have a dedicated um, a team at your organization that uh, deals with uh, um, searches and, and uh, retrieval of PDFs, uh, they will for sure appreciate um, this dashboard that enables them to see in what projects they have uh, some work to do, like fetching some PDFs, and uh, which are fine for the moment. Of course, since Laser is built to support living reviews, this can change at any point in time. Uh, you may have new references to screen, new references that pass title and abstract screening that will then uh, require some PDFs. So um, this is something that you can um, uh, quickly see here on the list of uh, projects. Uh, you can also see that the default view is that I see projects that I'm uh, a part of, but uh, if I have uh, the sufficient privileges, I can also see all the projects in my organization, which is some sort of a workspace in laser AI. Uh, and this is especially uh, helpful when you have, I'm sorry, if you have um, um, uh, some uh, situations where somebody 
um, for instance, cannot uh, manage the projects anymore and, and somebody else needs to uh, step into their shoes and uh, continue the work on the project. So um, this helps you um, potentially join any of the projects as a manager or as a visitor. Um, so um, in turn, uh, this, you, you can use this um, to, for instance, share the results of uh, your work uh, with uh, any stakeholders that may be interested, like your clients, uh, you can invite them to join you in the tool and uh, make these projects available to them as uh, visitors. So um, you can see some other icons here. Um, I will just uh, give you a very short description of them because they are outside of uh, the scope of the basic webinar. Um, so uh, in this uh, um, next uh, module, you are managing your uh, users, so you can invite more people and assign um, um, uh, permissions to them. Uh, you also have different libraries uh, of stuff that you use frequently across projects. So uh, this includes um, uh, highlights, uh, vocabularies, or, or sometimes called dropdowns, where you can um, uh, define um, some typical lists of values that you can uh, reuse across um, um, across projects. Uh, one good example of this uh, is uh, the vocabulary for mesh terms, uh, where you can see uh, the, that we also support hierarchical vocabularies. Uh, you can import them uh, into the tool. Of course, we uh, didn't uh, type, uh, type in all these terms. Uh, and you can also link from any of the term um, to some external vocabularies. You can provide synonyms. All of this is used by our AI uh, to provide suggestions also for these vocabularies. Uh, and then uh, we um, have templates for screening criteria and extraction forms. And I will also get to this in more detail. Finally, we also have a couple of um, settings uh, for your organization. Uh, some of uh, the interesting one includes the possibility of defining the roles, because in every workspace, in every organization, these roles can both sound different. You can call them as um, to reflect uh, the uh, organization of work uh, within your team. And also, you can define who can do what. So uh, let's create a project uh, for this uh, webinar. Um, and um, I will uh, then um, walk you through the dashboard for, for a project. So you can probably already recognize uh, some common themes. Uh, we also have a sidebar on the left. If you look at um, the top bar, you can now see that we are in a, part, in a specific project called webinar. Um, I have a summary, summary of all the stages that I selected uh, for this project. You also have uh, the freedom to define uh, other stages or uh, to include only some of them in your project. Uh, and then um, I see that I'm the only person in this um, uh, particular project and that, that I have no references. So let's do something about it. And um, uh, here I will uh, drag and drop a RIS file from my disk um, to import some references that uh, we'll explore as part of this demo. Um, you can see as this is importing that you can also associate some label. So I can, for instance, say that this is uh, the January search. Uh, and then um, if I, for instance, do a, an update, I can upload another file. Uh, this will become a list uh, with labels that I um, uh, connect here. Um, uh, and of course, you can see the progress of um, the import here. I um, the, Already all the references uh, have been imported. Uh, and now I can go to the first stage, which is title and abstract screening, uh, which again shows uh, a dashboard. Um, and uh, in this dashboard, uh, you can see that some of the blocks have yellow bars, some have gray bars, and some have blue bars. And um, this communicates uh, whenever you have some tasks uh, as a project manager to perform or not. So um, uh, for the yellow tasks, you um, uh, need some action here. Uh, so uh, let's click the first one as, and set up the screening instructions. 
I will uh, use a template that uh, we prepared uh, ahead of time just to make this um, a little bit uh, um, uh, faster, but it also doesn't take a lot of time to set this up. But I just wanted to um, spend a minute here to explain what we mean by screening instructions. So uh, typically, for instance, in your systematic review protocol, uh, you have your inclusion and exclusion criteria. And uh, what we found very useful uh, is to define multiple exclude, exclusion buttons. And this is also consistent with, uh, for instance, Prisma 2020, um, even for title and abstract screening. So in other words, um, you can define as many of these buttons as you want, starting with just having one. So then you just include or exclude something. But if you want to have more, uh, you can uh, follow the um, structure that we have, for instance, in this uh, screen. So uh, the first exclusion button will be for incorrect study type. So again, it says study type, but um, and I can also, of course, rename it. But um, uh, the uh, way we typically set it up is uh, um, by saying that this button will be used whenever a uh, study has incorrect study type. You can also provide instructions to your uh, screeners to explain what really um, you expect as a uh, um, correct or, in, or incorrect study type and um, load or uh, provide uh, some highlights. So these will be keywords that can be used for filtering and they will be also uh, highlighted in title and abstract text. As you can see from this screen, you can also provide wildcards. So um, I can highlight anything that starts with random, or I can also create um, wildcards for uh, keywords that end with a particular um, uh, word. So, um, so this follows for other uh, criteria. We have just three here. It's also very common to have uh, uh, four, also for a uh, comparator, but let's just keep things simple. What you can see uh, on the screen as well uh, is um, a tag uh, that uh, in this case is called relevant SR. And uh, this also comes from the fact that very often when you screen, uh, even if um, you are looking for primary studies, you are not interested in including systematic reviews, um, you may want to tag some of the references as interesting, for instance, for um, um, uh, following the citation graph, uh, for, or for Bible mining. Uh, so uh, even if you include these studies because of incorrect study types, so by clicking this uh, first button here, uh, you can at the same time associate this tag. And of course you have uh, the freedom of associating as many tags as you want. Important caveat here is that the tags don't trigger screening conflicts. So if you have two people um, in double screening and they associate different tags it won't be flagged as a conflict by the system. Uh, on the other hand, if they um, uh, select different exclusion reasons, this will be um, uh, treated as a conflict. For uh, some projects, uh, indeed, it may be something that you want, but for other projects, you may not be interested in resolving these conflicts, which takes me um, to this uh, part of the screen that you can see here. Here I can define how we will uh, resolve screening conflicts, and uh, I have two choices to be made here, what I do with in versus out conflicts and what I do with out versus out. So uh, for uh, instance, for out versus out conflicts, instead of saying that I want uh, this to be resolved by researchers, I can set a hierarchy of exclusion reasons, which means that uh, whenever um, somebody excludes uh, for study type, another person excludes for population, study type will uh, be um, ch uh, chosen as the uh, final answer. So um, of course I can customize this and what's more, you can for instance start with um, uh, this conflict not being um, uh, resolved automatically. So uh, they will just accumulate. Uh, you will see uh, these conflicts, which can be helpful, especially in the beginning of the project. Um, and then after you see what types of conflicts you have, or maybe at a later stage of the project, uh, you can change your mind and you can change how you um, deal with the conflict. So uh, this can be also very helpful uh, when uh, resolving in versus out conflicts, for instance. 
Okay, so you can see that I have still some uh, yellow bars. Uh, the first one says that I cannot use double screening because I'm the only person in the project. So um, I will invite my uh, colleague Iga uh, to join me. So uh, since this is our um, private workspace, I see names of all the people. Uh, and um, um, once I have now two people in the project, you can see that it's um, now blue. Now I can set up uh, the distribution. So um, in laser, uh, you um, uh, decide who will do what and in what uh, also um, proportion. So if we have two people and we have double screening, then of course it's not possible um, not to divide the work uh, equally. Uh, but uh, if I uh, switch to single screening, which I can still do at this point, um, then uh, you will see that uh, I can uh, distribute the work uh, in, for instance, such a way that uh, one, of, um, one of us will do much more than the other person. And of course, we also support um, different um, setups here, like uh, pairing people together, um, distributing only uh, some number of, of references and so on. So uh, I will go back to double screening and I will um, say that I want to distribute all uh, these tasks um, to both people and also do the same for all the future references. Uh, so, and this uh, really um, uh, uh, is the end of the basic project setup. Uh, once I distributed the uh, work, you can see that a new icon appeared on my sidebar. And um, this takes me to the tasks that are assigned to me personally as a as person doing the screening. So we have some sort of a firewall here in the tool uh, between uh, the management part and the research part. Uh, the idea here is that uh, you don't want to unblind yourself by mistake. So for instance, if you do screening uh, in this project, but uh, you are, you're also a manager, then you will be able to see um, screening decisions, for instance, from other people. Uh, so um, not to bias yourself uh, by looking or peeking at uh, the screening decisions from your colleagues, uh, we build this navigation so it's much more difficult to um, kind of um, catch a glimpse of references that you, are, um, um, yet, that you yet have to screen. Uh, but in this view, I just wanted to show you quickly a couple of um, important things. So first of all, after I open the references that I have to screen, I have a, I see the list of references. And you can already do screening here. Uh, you can, for instance, um, select multiple um, references, which can be helpful when you do title-based screening. And using the buttons here on the bottom, you can um, make decisions about them. Um, however, uh, the dedicated view for doing this um, screening is activated when, for instance, I click this icon or double click uh, one of the references. And this takes me uh, to something we call the focus mode, uh, where you look at one uh, reference at the time. Uh, and um, you can um, also uh, see all the uh, comments and, and uh, tags available here. You can see the uh, information about these references to the left. This screen uh, can be operated uh, using your keyboard. Uh, so I can include or exclude um, references uh, for uh, using the keyboard shortcuts that I have listed here. So as you can see, as a screen, uh, I'm presented with um, next references from the list. Um, and we have a machine learning model in the back end that learns from your decisions here and constantly reorders the references. Uh, so you see the more relevant first uh, before you go um, to, to, to the remaining ones. So um, this, of course, have a, a lot of um, advantages, especially if you are doing more targeted or scoping reviews uh, when you are not expected to screen everything, because then based on this ranking and based on the predictions from the machine learning model, uh, you can potentially choose to stop screening early. But in systematic reviews, typically we need to screen everything. So people ask us, uh, so what's the, really the advantage of using the ranking 
if you, I need to screen everything um, anyways. So, uh, and uh, based on our experience and um, conversations with our users, um, we um, know several um, advantages of, of um, using screening, um, uh, ranking in uh, such screening. So the first one, which is maybe quite obvious, is that you catch all the tricky cases early on. So uh, it's uh, if there are some references that uh, may um, be, let's say, less obvious how to screen them and may require some discussion, um, how you interpret the screening uh, instructions, it's, it's much better to catch these cases early. Um, also, uh, you can focus much more if you uh, have the relevant references first, and then uh, at some point you will be just excluding references. You um, will probably see that uh, it makes your work more efficient. It's much harder in the beginning because you uh, make the hard decisions, but then uh, you kind of uh, um, um, uh, take the benefits of, of um, this uh, hard work in the beginning. And finally, uh, a strategy that our users um, implement a lot um, is um, uh, the possibility of using the filters to narrow down the list of references and then to screen them in, let's say, clusters. So um, uh, since um, uh, the, the search results here were imported from uh, PubMed, uh, you can see mesh terms that we uh, imported automatically. You can uh, do searches um, not only for individual terms that were associated with these references, but you can also uh, use the mesh hierarchy to uh, search for all the matching terms um, uh, that fall into one branch of this tree. Um, and uh, you can also use the um, keywords that were um, suggested by the project manager or extend them if you want um, to potentially um, identify um, all the references that are about, uh, for instance, uh, mm, uh, pediatric population. And then when you enter the focus mode, what you will see uh, is that um, uh, you are now um, verifying whether all these references should be excluded because of incorrect population. And uh, you can still make use of the ranking. So um, the references that are more, most likely to be included uh, go first. So um, in our experience, this really helps a lot with um, uh, your screening, even if you uh, need to screen all the references. So um, uh, full text screening follows. And um, since uh, uh, we would need to first go through uh, screening by two people and config resolution, I will quickly uh, switch to another project that we um, created beforehand uh, that uses exactly same data. Uh, to show you how uh, full text screening looks like. So, um, so here, uh, let's say this is like a fast forward on the same project uh, where we uh, uploaded a couple of um, PDFs already and we can uh, do full text screening. So uh, the full text screening interface uh, um, is in some way very similar to what we had in the title and abstract screening. But of course, the big difference is that we have the PDF for now. Um, and um, uh, in here, it's also possible to define multiple buckets for including references. So whenever you do like one review uh, across many PICOs and you're interested to tag uh, which PICO um, uh, this uh, study applies to, uh, this is uh, your tool of choice uh, because then you can very easily um, first uh, make um, um, this choice during your screening and then potentially resolve conflicts because these choices will trigger screening conflicts. Uh, and here you can also um, consult your uh, screening uh, um, uh, form. You can see that in full text screening, we have much extended instructions. Um, uh, they are based on what you have in title and abstract screening, but they are now um, uh, uh, they are now extended as uh, is, no is normally the case in full text screening. Okay, so uh, finally, uh, after all the hard screening work, you go to data extraction, and um, uh, here I um, just wanted to show you um, quickly how our project looks like once we. Um, uh, implement the data extraction form. 
data extraction form again uh, is something that we um, provide you with. You are free to customize this. Um, and um, uh, this tool is really flexible in this regard. We often get asked um, how uh, you can kind of um, adjust the screening, uh, the extraction forms to your needs. So as one example, uh, the tool is really used across many use cases uh, to extract data from animal studies, to extract data from clinical studies. Uh, we even have a group that uses the tool to do um, scientific impact analysis. So um, this is really a general purpose uh, uh, extraction tool. However, um, uh, we provide you with some templates to get you started on, uh, on typical tasks in, in data extraction. So uh, the interface for doing this extraction, again, uh, is probably already familiar to you. Uh, we have the list of references and, uh, and we uh, now can enter one of them uh, by double clicking um, uh, its name. Uh, and uh, here you have your data extraction form on the right and PDF on the left. Um, what we find uh, many uh, groups uh, using um, is some spreadsheet to do data extraction, perhaps in Microsoft Excel, uh, where you typically go column by column. So different fields are extracted, um, let's say left to right. Uh, what we have in, the, in laser uh, is more like a vertical a layout where you go from top to bottom. Uh, but um, having in mind that we have this rotated, you can potentially already see many um, similarities to the data extraction forms that you use. Um, this is how um, this uh, study looks like the first time you open it. And all the uh, uh, fields in yellow are the ones for which we have uh, machine learning suggestions. So um, I can now click any of these fields like study ID, and this will take me to the place in the PDF that uh, our AI used to make this prediction. So um, this should make it very uh, easy for you to actually verify whether this prediction is correct. If it's incorrect, then um, you can um, at all times, of course, um, modify the extracted um, uh, value. Uh, and um, you can also highlight something in the text and associate this as a, let's say, secondary highlight uh, with your extracted value. So this allows you um, to make uh, work of your colleagues easier when they um, um, go in to verify your extraction because it's much easier for them to see whether everything is correct if uh, they have these highlights. To make their job even easier, you can also provide comments. Uh, whenever you are in doubt, um, you can uh, explain here why you made this particular choice. Um, so uh, for many of the fields, you will see that uh, the machine is already providing you multiple highlights, especially for the ones that are uh, not so let's say, obvious what to choose there. Uh, so one good example um, that I can highlight here is everything that relates to risk of bias. So of course, with risk of bias, it's really a judgment call. So the tool helps you here by uh, providing um, more um, highlights for every choice um, to, to, to make, it, might make it easier for you to, to make your decision. And uh, finally, when you um, do the extractions, you will very often find a lot of data, not in the text, but in the tables. Uh, so to this extent, uh, we have a module that um, uh, is able to, first of all, detect the tables, as you, as you can see here. And uh, for instance, here I have a table that lists uh, baseline characteristics. I can click this table, uh, and this opens uh, a, a preview of how the machine uh, uh, reads the table. Of course, as you very well know, um, the tables are formatted um, in various ways across different journals and across time. Um, so in many cases, we need to use um, some computer vision uh, algorithms to do this parsing. Uh, and once this is um, done, uh, you can select how you want to extract the data. So you can say that, for instance, all uh, that I have here is uh, uh, about baseline characteristics. I can say that the first field 
uh, is the name of baseline characteristic. Then I can, uh, for instance, say that um, this is the value that I would like to extract. Uh, but since sometimes we have also numbers in, in um, parentheses, I can see that the other one is probably the variance. And then when I select multiple ones, you can already see um, how the tool highlights the other value. Uh, and um, for uh, because this is like for the first subpopulation, I can also potentially fill um, um, some, um, uh, some additional uh, field saying that this is for, uh, for instance, um, uh, this subpopulation. And after I move all of this information in the uh, data extraction form, what I find um, uh, really helpful is that you still have um, uh, all the tools that we provide for our machine suggestions. So you have the highlight, uh, you can accept or reject these highlights, you can modify the text, and the highlights also stay there uh, for years to come. So, you, so they can be used by people doing quality assurance. And um, uh, you can also go back at any point in time to your extracted data and see where exactly it was uh, taken from. This is, uh, of course, very useful, especially when you, um, uh, when you do, for instance, unit conversion. OK, so um, I know it's, it was uh, probably a very um, um, condensed um, pack, uh, package of information, but uh, um, we hope that um, this shows you how uh, to use the tool from the very beginning to the very end when you um, do the extractions. The part that we haven't covered here is how you ex uh, export the data. Uh, and uh, to, to a large degree, because um, since people are using different statistical tools and they need different outputs, um, these are typically also customized based on uh, the data extraction forms that you uh, provide. Uh, but please let me know whether uh, you have any questions about this um, in the QA and uh, Q&A session. And now I hand over to my coll colleague Iga, uh, who will uh, walk you through the new and noteworthy features uh, of Laser that we are launching this month. Yeah, thank you, Arthur. Uh, so for today's webinar, we have prepared a very brief video that is a kind of a summary of uh, the newest version of Laser. And here, uh, continuing our tradition of naming a new version after elements from periodic table, uh, we call it Helium. And as Artur said, if you have any questions regarding new features as well, please let us know in the chat. And Shelby, if you can please share with us a video. In Laser, we start the year with a new version of the tool, Helium. Let's see what it brings us. Let me start with the change that influences all the users, regardless of their role in a project, project dashboard. Now, all team members, after selecting a project from the list, will share the same core of the dashboard, where everyone can track overall progress. We are looking at the dashboard from manager's perspective. Here, manager will be able to easily share a brief description, add the link to some external documents, and make sure that all researchers are on the same page. Now, let's see your researcher's view. Viewer sections number reflect the differences in their permissions, but the core remains the same. Speaking of the researcher's perspective in the focus mode, we can find several changes that improve the user experience. Without leaving the focus mode, uh, as a researcher, I will be able to open a panel to check the bibliographic data, or if prefer, I can, it can always be on top. I can switch to the view of full instruction in case of any doubts. I can also navigate to different reference lists and, for example, go back to a specific record to double check. I can configure the working view according to my preferences. For example, I can change the width of each side panel, can resize the PDF, and all these changes will be saved in my account. So I can switch seamlessly between references and projects. 
What is more, I can now upload missing references or add an, an appendix. The new document will be available right away to other researchers. To better save your needs, the data extraction form has been redesigned as well. Here, as before, you can quickly go through easy model suggestion and confirm or reject. But in most cases, we have to dig deeper. That's why all fields have the possibility to be extended. This can be done by clicking on the suggestion value or the field name. Now I can see an entire suggestion and I'm referred to a specific part of the text based on which the suggestion was created. I can navigate to different highlights in the text. If a manager provided any instructions, it can be found under the info icon. If needed, there is a field for free text comment. When all is done, we can jump to the next one. The most time-consuming and error-prone activity in data extraction seems to be extraction from tables. With the help of AI, it's no longer a threat. Our models are able to detect tables in the study. All you have to do is to select one that contains relevant information for you and simply click on it. You will see the same table, but in a unified form. Now you need to determine which type of data it contains. In this project, we are interested in a few of the outcomes described in this study. So I will select a few rows and specify where they should go. We'll do the same for the numerical values. As you can see here, the percentage of patients reporting an outcome has been specified in brackets in the same column. We can get around this problem simply by adding here the name of the second field. This dataset will be given a different color to distinguish. And we'll do the same for the second column. Moreover, we can specify a value that can be filled in for each newly created object. In this study, p-value was not reported, so I will add it here. And also, I have specified the overarching category that apply to all of my outcomes. Now, let's click an extract button and voila! We can see how nicely the data looks already in the form. And as always, you can verify it by clicking on the extracted value. Expect further exciting changes to the data extraction and screening focus mode very soon. Now let's see what has changed for project managers. To help you better monitor the progress at each stage, we have added a more comprehensive method of indicating status. Now you can distinguish and filter references that have been claimed or distributed from references that are in progress, so have been saved as draft. In LASER, we are always trying to give you a full overview of changes in time. Data extraction is no different. Managers can now track what exactly was changed during primary extraction and QA, but it's not only about the history. It will soon be possible to make corrections of extracted value and add something new if plans have changed meanwhile and, for example, we need to extract another outcome. Another nice change that can make a life of a manager easier is automatic distribution. Let's see an example application in a screening project. Here we still have some unresolved conflicts in title and abstract screening stage and PDF retrieval has been started, but still we are missing 10 PDFs. However, we can already go to the full text screening. The instruction is already in place and we can proceed to a distribution. You can choose from a number of distribution methods as before, but this time let's switch on automatic distribution. All 
currently available references will be distributed to researchers. Now, if our team members resolve conflicts from title and abstract screening and decide to include some records to the full text, or our colleagues from a library department send us missing PDFs, we don't have to worry. All records will smoothly go to the next stage and researchers will be able to work without any interruptions. Finally, we have added a few changes that can help you adapt laser to your organization workflow. It's possible to select stages in the default project and preferred screening type to save you a few clicks each time you create a new project. And you can also decide what information will be displayed above each record throughout the tool. Now, let's create something with our new settings. Here we have our default project type that consists of title and abstract screening and full text screening. And in the stage dashboard, we can see preferred screening type. That's all for today. Thank you very much and let us know how you find the changes. Thank you very much, Arthur and Iga, for all of that. That was really great. I see that we have a lot of questions in the Q&A, so I think we should get straight to that so we can answer as many as possible. Um, I suppose the first question we received was, does laser AI take the grade methodology into account? Yeah, so um, I'm happy to answer this one. So you may know us, uh, I mean, our team, uh, as uh, the company behind GradePro. Uh, so uh, Grade is in our, uh, I would say, um, bloodstream. <laughs> and uh, of course, we um, take this into consideration when building AI, uh, laser AI. At the same time, this is a tool of, uh, I would say, much uh, greater applicability. So. Um, uh, if you, um, for instance, do something that uh, uses great, then uh, in our templates and in our uh, training materials, we will find uh, references how to um, implement great when using laser AI. However, you are not forced to do this. Okay, great. Um, the next question, will laser AI deduplicate across imported files? So this is uh, something that is coming in um, uh, very, very soon, so in the next release, and um, I will be very happy to show you how to do this in laser during the next webinar, so please stay tuned. Great. Um, is laser AI focused on certain review types, for example, drug type, uh, drug, drug studies, or can you create any review type, for example, also for observational studies? So uh, we already have examples of, of people doing the reviews of uh, observational studies. Um, You're uh, free, free to do this. Um, one of this, uh, I think this question might have been answered already, but uh, for the screening title and abstract specifically, are these done by human or by AI? So, um, and kind of linking this to another question um, that is perhaps a little bit down the list. Um, we are not doing anything fully automatically here in the tool. <clears throat> uh, whenever we do something automatically, you uh, have the possibility of uh, reviewing the results and uh, potentially correcting um, uh, the tool. So um, in terms of uh, screening, um, uh, you really have a choice whether you uh, want to screen everything by hand and then you can see that, uh, say that everything is screened by human or when, uh, whether you would, for instance, like to uh, screen only a portion of references by hand or maybe screen every uh, reference um, uh, um, uh, by, let's say, one person and then uh, delegate um, the uh, double screening to AI. Uh, but it's, it's your choice. So I would say that um, it's possible for AI to do screening, uh, but uh, it's very unlikely that it will do all the screening for you. And um, how much you would like to involve the automation um, is your choice. Okay, thank you. Um, the next question we had from Louise is, can you have it so that you have multiple exclusion reasons? So um, it's, it's not possible, let's say directly by uh, selecting multiple, um, buttons. Uh, what, what can be done is, uh, for instance, you using the tags uh, to provide some additional information on, on exclusions. 
Here, uh, this was built to follow uh, Prisma flowchart when, especially at the full text screening, you need to specify what is the exclusion reason for every reference. And these numbers need to add up to the, um, to the total list of uh, screened references. Okay, great. Um, are the results of the machine learning available to users so that users can set in their protocol and or report in their final manuscripts uh, threshold statistics for stopping screening? So uh, we are not making the scores available as you screen because we thought it will uh, unnecessarily uh, bias people, but you, but you can um, take the uh, results after you finish the screening and, um, and potentially include this in your report. Okay. Um, is it possible to assign records to be screened to specific screeners in the project? For example, studies on pediatrics to screeners who have such a clinical background. Not possible at the moment, but a great suggestion and something that we are working on right now. Great. Um, this question, this next question kind of relates to another question we received further on is, how are we different from distiller? And the, the related question is, how do we differ from confidence? Yeah, so of course, this is a... Um... A question that is, uh, you know, that can be answered uh, a little bit differently for every group, right? Because uh, um, there are many differences, and uh, for some of the groups, <clears throat> sorry, some of these differences are more important, and for others, uh, are uh, let's say less important. And I don't want to do dodge the question or uh, to kind of confront our uh, competition um, or avoid confronting the competition, but, but this is the reality that, um, you know, if we um, have uh, people that come from these other tools to us, very often they cite data extraction as the main driver. Um, and um, also uh, some features related to, uh, for instance, workflow management, um, like, um, for instance, uh, removing people during the, uh, or people leaving the team, sorry, during the project and the reassign, uh, reassigning uh, work from them. But, you know, also a, an important part here is that uh, while we focus on features, it's also about the, um, let's say, gestalt, about the, the, the whole tool um, appearance, the ergonomics and so on. And I believe that this is also an important factor here. Great, thank you. Um... And this might relate to the previous question that was asked. Um, is there any automated title and abstract and full text screening using AI? Um, do you have anything more to add to that based on the previous question? I think that um, I don't have anything to add right now, but uh, um, I hope to unveil something that we are working on right now uh, soon. So um, also please um, uh, sign up for our uh, newsletter if you want to be the first to know. Great, okay. Are the different study formats available by default or do they have to be created? Uh, we um, have these dropdowns or how we call them controlled vocabularies um, uh, that support um, uh, extraction, let's say, of, of typical um, study formats. Uh, and then you can also extend this. So, uh, uh, but we, we try to make the tool uh, and we include batteries uh, in, in the tool when you start. Thank you. Um, this next question, I believe, has been answered. But is what is the one main strength of laser AI, if I'm right in saying, based on what you've said, that is data extraction, at least compared to the competitors? Um, anything more on that? Or can we move on? Yeah, I guess that. Um... Iga, maybe <laughs> it's, it's a difficult question, so I will uh, kind of escalate to you. Uh, I, 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 I hope thank you can you. also. Thank, thank you. Uh, so I would say that one of the differences is also how we can operate on laser is uh, also pretty easy. I hope uh, you can use mostly your intuition to, to operate on this. And I would say that uh, here we are uh, focused uh, to to make the tool possible uh, to use without any uh, previous training. Okay, perfect. Um, in extraction, what if you have multiple publications for the same review, 
how does AI extraction work and will it read all associated publications? So um, there are like two answers uh, or the, the answer is really uh, like um, to, to stage. So first of all, you can upload multiple uh, PDF files uh, for one reference. Um, so let's say for supplementary material, uh, you may want to um, upload more than one file. And um, here, I hope that uh, I'm also indirectly answering the question <clears throat> about you know what happens if you have like supplementary material. Uh, the AI will run on all of uh, these files, uh, so the table extraction will also work on uh, on the extra files. Uh, then, <clears throat> if you <clears throat> kind of detect during uh, the course of your project that you have multiple reports on of the same study, um, uh, in laser it's built in such a way that the let's say unit of work is a study, really, not a reference. So then you are we are able to link multiple references um, to uh, be one study. Um, I don't believe that there is like a standard term for this process, but uh, for instance, Cochrane um, uh, Registry of Studies calls this studification, and this is also the term that we use internally. Um, so um, in this sense, you are also able to um, then see multiple references uh, and all these PDFs from all these references uh, will be available <clears throat> together in the data extraction mode. Okay, thank you. Um, does laser AI have a ready template for using the risk of bias tool 2.0? I'm sorry, I haven't my, unmuted myself. Yeah, yeah, we uh, we have risk of bias um, point, uh, 2.0 um, supported here. Um, also, uh, there was a question about um, how risk of bias is performed. Uh, I uh, went through this really quickly during my um, presentation, but uh, you can see that uh, the tool kind of highlights, um, you know, the, the pieces of text that suggest answers across different domains. But of course, with risk of bias, very often you need to read between the lines. So uh, for this reason, we, uh, we, we highlight the text that we think kind of points towards an, any particular uh, answer. Uh, and then uh, you make the choice. We, we can suggest the choice, but, but typically, uh, you know, the choice is yours because at the same time, very often uh, it's a judgment, right? So um, uh, we don't want to kind of delegate um, these judgments to the machine because uh, in the end, uh, it's not the machine who is responsible for the results. Um, so very often we don't um, train the machine to be let's say, overly um, arbitrary, let's say, in this uh, answers. Uh, if we are not sure what to suggest, if it's not very clear, then we'll just highlight uh, stuff for you, for, 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 for you to make the final decision. Great. We've got five minutes left, so let's carry on. Um, does laser AI learn about what to include or exclude along the process of selection? Yes, so um, th this is correct. The, um, the the ranking is built on um, on uh, the, your decisions to include or exclude. Uh, so every single decision is is taken into account, uh, and of course we need to have at least one included study uh, for this ranking to to start working. Okay, and uh, can it also, can it also digitize data points from graphs? Yeah, so um, I, I love this question because uh, this is uh, my project at the moment to, <laughs> to make it work. Um, it's uh, uh, even more complex than with tables uh, because with tables, we, they already come in different uh, kinds and, and uh, sizes and shapes. Uh, with graphs, it's uh, even worse. <laughs> so, uh, but uh, what we start with um, is the possibility of extracting data from uh, Kaplan-Meier plots and from uh, patient flow charts. Uh, so uh, we, as with many things that we do, uh, we first try um, to kind of address the most, um, um, let's say, dire needs and, um, and uh, when, when we can really move the needle. Uh, and um, then we kind of go step by step, uh, including other types of, of plots. Okay, and then we're going to take one more question before we have to end it today. How are you looking at consensus of extraction for double extraction? 
So, um, uh, so the let's say typical workflow uh, that we implement is um, uh, primary extraction followed by quality check. So the second person is kind of seeing the results from uh, from the first one, and this is what most of the groups that we work with um, do, in, especially when uh, extracting like data. Now, for risk of bias assessment, uh, we of course want to to make it possible to do double extraction. Um, or double assessment. And uh, to this extent, when you do the quality check, um, the results from the first person will be hidden. Uh, so you will see them all, only after uh, completing yours, and then uh, you can compare the results. Okay, thank you very much. Um, fortunately, all the time that we had for, for today, um, I really want to thank you, Arthur and Iga, for your time, and as well as all the participants and all the engagement. This has honestly been a very incredible webinar. We're really excited to share all of this with you. Um, stay tuned and feel free to contact either myself, shelby.storm at evidenceprime.com, or Kirsty, which is kirsty.watson at evidenceprime.com. Thank you very much for attending. Thanks so much. Thank you.